I guess what I'm here to talk about a little bit today is something that um, I've spent 30 years of my life working on over the years. I had no idea I would get into this field because I graduated as a mining engineer. But a gentleman who I talked to on the phone yesterday that Ken knows, John Kelly, keeps after me as well as Walter Kerluck to carry on down this path. Um, so what I want to show you is a little bit, and I, I guess I should stand back and say this is after uh, 15 years of being the head of mining research for INCO, um, run it come, came to running mines research in the Ontario division, and then uh, being 10 years a Canadian research chair at the university in Sudbury, probably more like 15 and then starting Penguin as a way to take the work that was done at INCO and the work that we carried on doing through the students and the work I did and get it into commercial application. Um, we sit on the cusp of two commercial products which I'm going to talk to you about today that I think are very important for the mining industry. But before we do that, I want to talk a little bit about this transformation. When I started my career, I could regularly go and see a guy with a jack leg in a stope doing the work that he or she was doing, mostly he. Um, but now we've got to the point where we have built larger scale industrial robots. I'm not talking about the kind of robots that are the iRobots that run around. I'm talking about units like that, which are just the control system for mining machines. So um, how many people in here have watched Star Wars? Do you remember the one section in the movie where R2-D2 gets lowered into the Jedi fighter and takes over control of the Jedi fighter? That's what that is for mining equipment. And I think that that's a very important way of looking at it. Um, it will tell you many, many things which I'm going to show you, but I want to go through it right now. That has the equivalent of a differential GPS system that will work underground. That's a major breakthrough in mining. Um, as big a breakthrough as differential GPS for open pit was. It has um, a device inside that then can link every information point that's attached to it to a geospatial position underground. So that means that every ore sensor, every laser scanner, every infrared camera, <coughs> every uh, gas measurement, every velocity measurement can all be geospatially located on a map within two centimeters anywhere underground. The implications of that will change fundamentally how we look at a number of things that we do from ventilation, which I don't know how many people are mining engineers, but K factors are a fudge factor that a mine ventilation engineer kind of does a Picasso and says, that's a point two. But nobody knows what a point two is other than that guy. And we base every bit of energy on every ventilation fan on that Picasso. And so what we're trying to do is become more quantified in what we do. I would hazard a guess to say that almost every mine in the world could save several million dollars in energy just by doing a survey with that robot and recalculating ventilation. On an annual ongoing basis, you could save that kind of money. So I want to just now go through a couple of things. If we want to shift mine prod profitability, I've heard all these questions over my career. Improve quality, hope for higher commodity prices. I heard that a lot <laughs> over the years. Go faster. Uh, we always have to maintain or enhance our safety as we're doing it. Improve recovery, reduce our costs, lower transportation, all while maintaining our environment. But the fundamental thing that we never, ever, ever talk about is we need to reduce the amount of work we do to get material out of the ground. If we can't do that, 
we will always conti continue to raise the cost of what we do. My old boss, John Kelly, used to describe it in his colorful language as, our costs are a big ball of crap, Greg. And every time we pull out a bunch of them, something else comes in to fill where we save money. And we have to find a way to actually reduce all those costs. Now this is a really controversial statement in our industry. It's not in the automobile industry. The bulk of our costs today are personnel. Um, 50 to 65 percent, if you go and look at every single mine plan that's been developed, are people. And then you have to add this big plus sign that says, and of the remaining 50 to 35 percent, at least 60 percent of those costs are putting people in the environment. It's ventilation, it's rock mechanics, it's support of people on equipment, it's travel to the work site, it's all those things. And we continue to in keep those costs in what we do while expecting our product costs to go down. And that's not going to happen. So we have to find a different way. What if we changed? What if pers we changed personnel for robots? That's not every single person, but the majority of them. Personnel, like I said, are 65% of the cost. It's interesting that robots are about the cost of two times the annual wage of a person. That's all they are. That's been demonstrated over and over again in other industries. Also, eventually that means that the reason that is, as they've done in the Toyota production system and a lot of the automobile manufacturing, eventually, depreciation results in free machine use. That's what the Toyota people recognized as they were putting in the assembly lines. And they were nearly driving the Americans out of business in their automobile business. Hell, they were competing with Nissan and nearly drove them out of business, but the government in Japan stopped it. The other thing that robots forced was a dramatic move in quality. In the mining industry today, we like to hear about Six Sigma quality and all these kinds of things. You can't get it unless you measure it. And, I, and there's all kinds of consultants out there. I'm, I'm hoping I'm not insulting anybody in the room, but there's all kinds of consultants out there that will tell you that we just need to apply Six Sigma quality. I've heard it a hundred times, or just apply this. But at the end of the day, you have to take fundamentally this approach and figure out how to do it. So I've spent most of my career by being led at the start of it with a video of an automobile manufacturing plant by Walter Curluck, John Kelly, Jim Ashcroft, and all these guys that people in here will know, who sat me down and said, you can't leave this room till you look at this, and that's what we want you to do. So do it. They sent me to Toyota, they sent me to Nissan, they sent me to Rockwell. The Canadian government paid for me to go around the world and look at, at uh, Mercedes-Benz, at BMW, at all these companies, and all of them did this. It just hasn't happened yet in mining. I find this slide of the two most key points in the Toyota production system extremely important to read. So I'm going to read them for you. One, worker and machine have been separated as much as, have to been separated as much as possible to promote production efficiency as well as effective and meaningful use of human resources. The second one that I find frightening for our industry is that since the late 1940s, that's a, a number of years ago. Toyota workers have not been tied to a single machine, but are responsible for five or more, feeding one while the others work automatically. Now, do you know many machines in the mining industry that work like that? Anybody in the room? I don't. I've never seen it, except for the times that we ran scoops from Toronto with one person running two machines. 
except for the time when we ran drills from the Palais de Congress with the guy running three drills. You're starting now, and, I, and I, I find it fascinating that having done that work nearly 30 years ago, that I walk around Mine Expo last week and I see a bunch of teleoperation workstations that we built in my second year of being in charge of research and development at INCO. It's just now, 20 some odd years later, starting to get its due. But at the heart of it is no different than what's in the automobile manufacturing. It gets a little more sophisticated. Mine-wide networking systems are very difficult to accomplish on a large scale. But now, if you install them as you do development, it's possible. And the systems are there with the bandwidths that are necessary to make that happen. That computer system, the yellow one that you see up there, is, is a box that we've developed in Penguin that'll fit on every single piece of mining equipment and we'll put, it's inside of that unit and it'll go in and run every piece of mining equipment that exists on the marketplace today. That little green box is a way, is how through uh, the use of military technology and an understanding of mining and going into the ground, we've been able to change the mathematics of that box to be able to have it work underground properly. Now imagine setting up a drill jumbo where you can put the drill bit within two centimeters where it's supposed to be every single time and not worry about the fact you can only do that in a straight, straight line, that you can go around corners and get the proper development done. That's the kind of thing that it'll accomplish. The differential GPS is very important and the ability for people to run machines. This is the move from old style surveying that looks like that to having a little droid that can go around and collect hundreds of thousands of data points per second. This unit was tested in Cadelco and I find it fascinating that the work I do is gaining more traction outside of this country than it is in it. And I'm I don't know whether to be annoyed about that or whether to be happy about that. But, you know, last week, Norilsk wants that unit at their place in the next month. They want to take it through their minds and they want to get it done. We've tried in this country to get that to happen and it's never happened. That was, those pictures are five years old. We've gone down to Cadelco, we've done that, and that set of pictures form the basis for creating the next level of machine from that, which I'm going to show you in a minute. That's the kind of data that that machine collects. Those pictures are as realistic of what you would see walking down a tunnel as I've ever seen before. We're now able to look not only at the actual physical layouts, but we can look into the rock up to a couple of meters. We can collect the information that's going on inside of that tunnel as we're using it. And we can collect that data at a rapid rate. Two and a half kilometers of mine tunnels were collected in two hours at that rate. And we're only using 1 million points out of the 30 million we collected because we have to form projects with companies like IBM and big data to be able to use that the right way. Because we're not using it the right way yet. But we have the data to be able to do it. Imagine what's important about this slide is that we're collecting 600,000 points per second over 10 kilometers before we have to re-reference. And we can run that with one, one person running it or we can have one person run several of these as they're driving around in the mine. Now, it's not going to be over a Wi-Fi. I can guarantee that because it's not, we don't have enough capacity. But the networks do today and we know how to build them. 
But look at the result. Look at the cost per point compared to survey. That's the difference. Do you know who makes a decision about buying that machine? The surveyors. Do you think they want to do that? <coughs> They'll put themselves out of business if they do. But maybe they need to be out of business. Maybe it's not right. So with the outcome of that droid, mine operators can work within scanned environments that have, the informa have information never before available. That data that I showed you, it didn't get put in a regular database. It got put in a gaming engine. That's what your kids are using when they run their PS4s. That's the gaming engine. And that, what I'm about to show you, is the equipment that can work inside of the gaming engine as models where the environment's collected and the machine that we're going to use is in the gaming engine for safety purposes. Somebody can now look up inside of that model where it's unsafe to go and see what's going on. Today, when we go to bring down hangups or we go to do stuff, we get, and I know Nathan's done it and others, you take your cap lamp off and you go stand at the side of a draw point and you go like that and you look inside and say, gosh, I'm going to stand off to the side so I don't get dinged and killed. But now we can go in and collect the gaming stuff and be able to look at it. That's a machine that's just been delivered to Cadelco, and Scott and Cavi are going down with me to test it probably in November or December. Cadelco's biggest problem in their block caving operation, 15 hangups per day. Every day you got 15 people going in with bamboo poles and duct taped explosives and reaching in under 60 meters of rock over their head and putting a pole up and we think to, seem to think that that's safe. There's nobody that would do that in their right mind if they didn't have to. But you know what? We've justified it. We've said, oh, you know, if you stand off to the side and you get enough bamboo poles and, and you don't, you know, we won't take the risk. We, at least we won't tell anybody we're taking the risk. But on graveyard shift, if it's really stubborn, we'll go right in underneath and we'll do that. And that's not right. Robots are made to do dirty, dangerous, dull jobs and noisy. This is the machine system that we put together. And uh, it's got Wi-Fi, it's got a new form of optical system which our business is probably going to do very well at. Because right today you're just starting to hear about this technology called Li-Fi. And Li-Fi is Wi-Fi using light. It happens that we hold all kinds of patents and transmitters and receivers for Li-Fi that are going to have a huge impact in Silicon Valley and all those places around the world. But we've had to develop it for mining. And so we have that technology. And when you put it all together, you can make stuff like this happen. That's the inside of that truck with the teleoperator being that person right there. So if you want to ask him any questions about it, he's a young engineer. But what's important down in that lower right hand screen is that's drilling a hole in rock. It's turning the whole head around and loading stick powder with a detonator on it and pulling it away. That's for all those people that have told me over my career you couldn't automate drilling and blasting. It can be done. And I get tired of hearing and maybe I should uh, Claudio Barsotti took me aside one day, and I don't know how many people in here may or may not know him, but he made me kill every rock cutting project we had at INCO because he said it's still not energy efficient, Greg, and it's not going to be energy efficient until there's some form of breakthrough. So get used to figuring out how to use chemical explosives and use them really, really well. This is now the next step collecting the data. So this robot's collected the data, but this is now industrially collecting the data of the rock mass. 
we take that information from that scanner and it's a cheap scanner. We didn't want to use expensive ones <coughs> so that we could put it right at the business end in the stove where it could get hit and knocked off and dinged and all those things because we're going into an unsafe human condition. And then we collected and put up that kind of information in a, in a uh, scanner and then we put it inside a gaming model that your kids could run. And that person who's running that job now is running that game, not that robot. The robot in behind is doing the work that that game is doing. We filed for about 10 different patents as a result of that because being able to do that is very important, not just in our industry, but in the military. So now that we've done all that, and those are the things that are both being commercialized as we speak, I want to give a little view for what I think the future is going to hold. I left a, a, a major mining company's think tank about six months ago. And that major mining company was looking for ways to create bio-leaching or some new way of mining that was going to be more selective and do more things, um, partially for narrow veins and partially for others. So we came up and had this before we even went to that. It's a robot miner, a small little thing that puts all those devices in that if you pick the right method, right mining method, you can put it inside and people will never have to go in there. The right method is a method that today is almost outlawed, which is called shrinkage mining. And a shrinkage mining stope is done for following veins. We can go in and not only have that robot, but we can position ourselves inside of that space we can do a 3D model of the ore up above it before we go and mine it. We can uh, go in and drill the round uh, all totally automatically. And I've set up with a big, one of the big explosives companies for automatic explosives loading and detonation. And we can do the whole process all at once with an all electric machine, which, which was a dream of people before because you couldn't get to all electrics, but now we can. The method's very simple. This is a typical shrinkage stove. It's only in 2D. You'd sink one single vent rays and you'd put the two pieces of equipment, uh, one up above and lower it into the area. And then you begin to shrink it into the draw bells, pulling it away with automated scoops. You'd build your way up continuing to blast down. You'd never have to have a truck. You never have to have any of those things in the actual ore body. And remember, we're always looking up here for where the ore is so we can adjust it and keep the dilution very low and the recovery very high. And build our way through until you mine. So what does that mean? These are the rough numbers. So I'm a mining engineer and I sit back and I look at them all. But the bottom line is that what I have in the bottom. You can get a three times improvement in throughput rate. You can get reduce the cost of mining in half, create a safe workplace, and that dramatically changes the MPV of the project. Like almost the numbers I ran, and I'll just use the raw numbers, were if you do a traditional shrinkage mine, it was about a billion dollars worth of NPV. Or sorry, $1.5 billion worth of NPV. If you do it at the robotic shrinkage mining, it's $2.5 billion for the same property. And so I think that that will, should, be able to change how we do things. So one of the things that I've decided to do is that since nobody in Canada will take this on, I will. I'm going to start a mining company, and I'm going to put this technology in it. 
And if somebody wants to be involved with me, I'm interested, but I'm going to do it because I'm not finishing my career not solving this problem. It's a very important thing to have done. You know, we've done enough of this. And I'd rather see us make this shift just like the robotics industry did and get the safety and quality and throughput performance that we really can get out of Canadian ore bodies. The ore bodies that will fit in that cover most of what's in northern Ontario and northern Quebec. And there's many other places around the world that they'll fit in. Once somebody does this, it will change everything. It will be like the automobile business when they went from people with screwdrivers and nuts and bolts and wrenches to robots. And the people that made that happen were Toyota. And there's no reason why that can't happen now. So we have the technology. We have the methods. I think we've got the smartest engineers in the world that are sitting around us. And we have the techniques to do it. The biggest barrier I see is culture. It was the culture at INCO, it's the culture in our mining business. And I've been working very closely with the Center for Applied Neuroscience in Australia to try and figure out how to change the culture to be able to make that a reality. So if somebody's interested, I'd love to talk to them. But we are going to do this. Thank you.